Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Crestview Austin Baptist Church. My name is Jeff Kramer, and I'm the pastor here at Crestview, and we're so glad that you chose to join us on our YouTube channel, Crestview Austin Baptist Church. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever gotten in trouble for trying to help someone? Someone was in trouble, and you decided that you would try to help that person in that situation. But as you tried to help that person, uh, someone comes along and misunderstands, and you are falsely accused of doing something which you did not do. Uh, you're beaten up. Uh, you are then imprisoned. Uh, you're arrested and put into prison, and you're put into handcuffs, and uh, your feet are in chains. And uh, my question is, if, if that's ever happened to you, what was your attitude when you were sitting in jail and you're thinking, all I did was try to help someone? Now, for me, if that had happened to me, I think I would have a pretty lousy attitude it's about what's going on. Can't you people see I was just helping? Uh, can't you understand that? Won't you just even listen to me? Nobody's even listening to my side of the story. They're just making assumptions, and you know, here I was trying to help this person, but now you're saying it's, it was not right, and so you just don't understand what's going on here. God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Well, you see, this is exactly what happened to Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. Uh, today, we're continuing our study of the Apostle Paul and Silas, on their second missionary journey. Now, last week we saw Pilot, uh, Paul and Silas in a Philippian inner prison with their feet fastened in the stocks. Now, before that, they'd had their robes torn off, uh, torn off them, and they were beaten with rods as many times, uh, more times than that could be counted. At first you might think, well, gosh, they must have really done something wrong to have been beaten and uh, arrested and then thrown into the inner prison and put into stocks. You must think what they did must have been really bad. But the truth is that they were being punished for casting out a demon in a young girl who was being used for profit. She was a fortune-telling uh, spirit, had uh, had inhabited her, had possessed her, and her masters were prostituting this uh, demon within her, and they were getting money for her telling fortunes. And so, as you remember, uh, Paul and Silas were just going around telling people about Jesus, and they had shared with Lydia and her household, and they had accepted Christ. And so this girl with this spirit followed them around, just saying, this is the uh, servants of the Most High God, they will tell you the way of salvation. And well, you know, they get irritated and then they uh, cast her out, cast the demon out, and all of a sudden the people get mad. So you would think after casting out this demon and this girl would, uh, being healed, you think they would have given them a hero's welcome. They would have put on a parade or something. But no, her masters were so upset because they weren't going to be able to make money off of her anymore uh, because she was not going to be able to tell people their fortunes anymore. Again, her, her masters were prostituting uh, her demonic powers to make a profit. And they were livid. They were angry. They were upset. They were outraged at Paul for taking their profit rather than celebrating this girl's freedom and health. Well, last week we saw how the old saying that no good deed goes unpunished. And in that case, it really is true. You see, God had opened a door for Paul and Silas to go to Macedonia, specifically to Philippi. Now, as a result of the open door, Paul had some great ministry opportunities. But now he found himself with Silas in the inner jail, uh, locked in a door, and now with his, their, feet, since their feet in stocks. So today we're going to see how praising God in spite of our circumstances can open the most barricaded door. You see, God closed the door for God. Uh, God closed the door for Paul to minister in Asia, and Bithynia, but He opened a door for him to go to Macedonia. 
So again, let's quickly review uh, the first uh, couple verses here, uh, verses 16 through 24. Uh, quickly review what happened, and then we'll, today we specifically pick up with Paul in prison. So first of all, we see, remember, that there was a confrontation with a, with a demonic in verses 16 through 18, and then there was an overcoming of uh, the power of darkness. So again, uh, you can, anytime that there is a movement of the Holy Spirit, you can always expect opposition, a counterattack from, from, the, from the demons and devils of, of the evil, evil ones. And so that's exactly what was going. There was people, uh, Lydia was accepted, had accepted Christ and the gospel was going out. And so now they had this girl possessed with a demon going around following. And of course, you know that, uh, that the demon actually gave her the, the power to prophesy. So, prophesy. so she, commit, she continued to do that, it says in verse 18, for many days. But Paul became annoyed. And again, he did not want... Uh, uh, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit be connected to this satanic spirit. So he, he uh, basically cast her out. And that, uh, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And that spirit came out that very moment. Uh, because again, uh, all the demons and the devil are under uh, the authority. They must obey the authority of Jesus Christ and the power of his name. Then in verses uh, 19 through 24, we saw how Paul and Barnabas uh, were beaten and imprisoned, where again, no good deed goes unpunished. So verse 19, it says, the masters saw that their hope of profit was gone. So they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. So they were just, again, livid. And we have pointed out before, and this is not the only time, notice that people are mad at Paul, not because they disagree with his theology, but because the theology of what happened to that girl as far as her being set free, it was affecting their profits. It was their money. It was all about money. Uh, they didn't really care about the theology, what was behind there. So then it goes on, the, the chief magistrates, the ones who, again, this is, Philippi is a Roman colony, and they were to... Uh, uh, behave and do the law according to Roman law. And so they thought they were just being, these guys were just Jews. So uh, they made up all trumped up charges against, against them, what they were doing. And, and then verse 22, it talks about the crowd rose up and then they were, uh, they, you know, again, tore the robes off and they were beaten. The idea is there, the, the word there is used, it means that they were uh, to go on being beaten. So it wasn't uh, a fixed number of, of, of lashes or, or strikes, but uh, basically the, they had these uh, poles these, that they uh, put together and just whipped them and basically till the person uh, got tired. So when they struck him with many blows, uh, probably I'm sure there was blood and they're uh, all over their back and front and they were thrown into the inner prison, which is the prison within the prison, which was the highest security. I'm sure it was dark and dank and stinky. And so last week, that's where we left them. They were sitting there uh, in that prison, uh, probably in, in physical pain. And of course, sitting there thinking, what in the world's going on here? Why did God allow this to happen? So uh, again, the crowd's frenzy uh, had caused, was part of the problem. And again, the, her masters, which were losing profit. But today we're moving on to see how praise can open the, the door of whatever we might find ourselves behind. So today let's pick up in verses 35 through 34, we see earthquakes and conversions. Specifically, in verse 25, we see that there is a midnight revival. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Isn't that interesting? After all they'd been through, after, again, their bodies being beaten, I'm sure that they were quite, could have, they could have been very discouraged. Uh, they started praying and singing hymns of praise. They were thanking God that he was in control. Uh, one of the old church fathers, Tertullian, made this comment. He said, nothing the limb feels in the stocks when the mind is in heaven. You see, their minds and their souls, their spirits 
were raised, they were lifted as a result of their praise to God. You see, Paul could sing hymns to God when he was confined in the stocks in the inner prison at midnight. You see, the one thing that you can never take away from a Christian is God and the presence of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit in their lives. With God, there is a freedom even in prison. And even at midnight, there is light. So Paul and, Whit Paul and uh, Silas here, a witness to the unbelievers through their attitude. Now think back to that, that prison cell. Again, if it had been me, I probably would have sit there kind of moping going, I can't believe this has happened to me. Uh, man, that, that really hurt and this stings and how long are we going to be in here? I guess we're just pretty much going to be, uh, prop they're going to go out and hang us. And, you know, it's very easy just to get negative and, and going, you know, <laughs> Paul could have looked at Silas and said, Silas, this is all your fault. And Silas could have looked over at Paul and said, Paul, this is all your fault. And then they both could have looked up and said, God, this is your, this is your fault because we, we didn't go where we thought we were supposed to go. And you told us to go to Macedonia. Uh, and, and so here we are in Philippi doing, going the open door route. And now look at us. Are you sure this is what, you know, did we misunderstand or did you send us here on purpose just to get us beaten and thrown in jail? Well, of course, those are horrible things to think, but those are the thoughts that enter our minds. But the truth is, Paul and Silas were so firmly planted in knowing that that is where God would have them go, that they were in the middle of God's will, and that sometimes when you're in the middle of God's will, you're right in the middle of a storm. And here, they're right in the middle of the prison, right as a result of doing what is right, ministering to that girl and, and freeing her from her demon possession. So one of the things that's going on here, again, is that we see that their attitude, it was a choice. Their choice in praising God. Now, I don't, I don't know what it was like and how it started. I don't know if they just kind of started out kind of slow. Oh, praise you, God. Yeah, God, I praise you. Yeah, la, 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 la. Or did they, you know, then finally go, Woo, son, praise God. We're, you know, if, I don't know if they started up here and stayed up here or, or they started slow and worked up high and went, ha, ah, son, just praise God. Look what he's doing. Look at the, look at the spiritual warfare. And, and yeah, we're getting a little nicked up, but God is winning. And so, you know, that's what I, what's going on here. They're singing praise to God. And the, and the thing is, which I don't even know if they thought about it, but every, all the prisoners were listening to him. Now, the other prisoners probably thought <clears throat> Paul and Silas were out of their mind. They're thinking, what kind of drugs are these guys on? Did they do a talk screen on these folks? You see, the <coughs> Paul and Silas were singing and praying, oh, God, thank you. You know, they, <coughs> they were singing and praising, and they're having a great time. Uh, why is that? Were they crazy? No, because they knew that God is in control. And, and that's what helps flip the switch from depression to praise and how praise can take us from being down to being lifted up in, in our minds and hearts and heavenly places around the throne of God because that's more real, that he's understood that the reality of heaven, the reality, the spiritual reality of God being in control was more true than what looked like them being uh, jailed and, and uh, put in a prison and being beaten. Now, yes, that was a circumstance, but what was true in heaven is more ultimately true than what we physically experience here and now. You see, we must be sure to note that the other prisoners were listening. And I'm sure the whole point, they were, rea they were watching how they were reacting to their problem. They're going, huh. Now, they don't seem drunk. They don't seem like they, they got a buzz. They don't seem like they've uh, been smoking or taking anything. Uh, you see, we need to remember this. It's very important. One of, one of the points of the passage is, is that the people are watching you as you go through your hard time. Uh, people are watching us as we go through difficult times. You see, our reaction to the crisis in our lives may make the difference of a person of whether they accept or reject Christ. 
Let's move on to verse 26 where we see jailhouse rock. Verse 26, it says, And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. So suddenly, in the middle of the praise meeting, in the middle of the prayer and the praise, ha, ah, son, thank you, God, there was an earthquake and those doors opened. Again, it was a miracle. God interceded with a miracle with the earthquake at that time and opened all the doors and their chains. Now, again, a miracle happened because as a result of their praise. Now, this is an interesting question, which I, I really can't answer. And I, I really don't know the answer is, do you think the miracle would have occurred? Would it have happened uh, if they had just sat there and kind of moped and pooched their lip out, lower lip out and, and just been kind of depressed and kind of down on God. God, I can't believe you're letting this happen to me. I can't, I'm doing all this stuff for you and you let these people beat us. And put, you know, I, do you, I wonder if the miracle would have happened. Part of me really thinks that it would not have. That, in fact, this story probably might not even, you know, the, this historical account would not be in here because we wouldn't want to know necessarily about it because I wonder how many other situations where Christians were in this situation and yet, uh, they didn't trust God, and, and they didn't start singing and praising and uh, praying to him. Uh, rather, they just turned their backs on God. So, well, God's turned his back on us. I'm going to turn my back on him. And then there's, there's never the miracle. But we see here it, it's too much of one thing happening when another thing happened uh, to see that I'm sure that the praise had something to do with God opening and sent, opening those doors and also um, uh, them being released. Then we look at verses 27 through 34, we see a family, a family salvation. So when, when the jailer awoke, he's going, I guess he's, you know, he, he was really tired and uh, probably didn't even hear much of what Paul was doing. And he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. So the jailer, if you remember, most of the, uh, most of the people there in Philippi were retired veterans. Uh, he was a former Roma, Roman soldier, so he was there to, you know, be in charge of the jail. So after the, the earthquake happened, he went, oh no, all the prisoners are gone and uh, they'd escaped, and he knew that he was going to be held accountable with his life. If they were gone, he was a dead man. He knew that, that he was as good as dead, and so he said, man, I'm not waiting for them to hang me. I'm going to take my sword, and I'm going to run it through and get it over with. And so, but Paul goes on, on, on and tells him, hey, listen, we're all here. Don't, don't do anything. Don't harm yourself. So, he probably couldn't believe it. He said, y'all, you're messing with me. I can't, you, you guys are probably all out of here. Well, no, uh, he was probably shocked. And, and Paul assured him they're all there. Uh, and again, think of this. Again, Paul, here's the man who's in charge of the prison. We don't know how he treated him, but he's probably part of those that maybe had even beaten him. And so, you know, somebody been probably mean to Paul. And, and now the door is... The, the, you know, was, the situation was down on the other foot to where, you know, Paul saw the guy had been so mean to him, he was about to take a sword. You know, some people would have said, yeah, just go right on because we're out of here. So Paul could have been vengeful. He could have been mean, uh, trying to get revenge on this man. But he said, no, 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 no. We're all here. So again, we never see a grudge in Paul's nature. You see, rather than taking revenge, he shared with him how he could have eternal life forever. So verse 29, it says, and he called for lights and rushed in, and that, that's the, the jailer. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Uh, and after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So at this point, the jailer knows something supernatural is going on. Something 
is going on beyond what he can understand. There's something supernatural. And so he wanted to know what to do. Because uh, this was obvious a miracle, a miracle number one, that, that the uh, doors had opened through the earthquake. The other miracle is they didn't run out because they could have run out and, and that would have been his life. And so he said, what must I do to be saved? Because uh, he probably did hear some of the singing. He probably did hear some of the praying. So he knew that something was going on between Paul and his God. Paul and Silas and, and, and Yahweh. And so he thought, man, what, I, I want to have a connection with that God. So what must I do to be saved? And so again, he was, he was stunned by the behavior of Paul and Silas. Uh, he was terrified by the earthquake and consequences, but uh, now, you know, even despaired of his life. So he basically asked Paul and Silas, what could he do? Well, this is the problem. There, there's absolutely nothing he could do for his own deliverance. Because watch what Paul tells him in verse 31. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. This is such a great verse. I encourage you to highlight it, underline it. Uh, memorize it, put it on your refrigerator, bathroom mirror, whatever. Uh, it simply tells us what a person, uh, how a person receives Christ, how a person has a right relationship with Christ, what a person must do to be saved. You see, the Christian uh, good news is simply communicated. It was simple and expressed by Paul and Silas. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe, if you want to be saved, if you want to be right with God, you have to believe in Jesus. Now, to believe, what does that mean? To believe means to have confidence in, uh, to have faith in. To believe means to, to believe in Jesus means to put your trust in Jesus. Uh, it's a complete trust. It's a complete reliance uh, to entrust oneself, uh, to have complete confidence uh, that with your total commitment to him, uh, you're going to be able to give your life to. Uh, Paul also makes this very clear in, in two of his other letters. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, Paul says, uh, he says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So when we recognize Jesus as Lord and trust in him with all our lives, salvation is assured. There's nothing we can do to make it happen. We must simply... Uh, accept what Jesus has done for us. We must believe in Jesus Christ. Then in verse 32, it says, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly having believed in God with his whole household. So you see the, G, the jailer believed in Jesus. Uh, as a result, as we can see almost immediately a, a change in his life, well, he took the missionaries to his house where his family could hear. Because as soon as he said, yeah, this is what I want, my whole family, my whole household needs to hear this. It says they were all baptized. And again, what we, which we talked a lot about last week, it was uh, in the New Testament, we see many times when a person believes they're uh, almost immediately baptized. Again, it's uh, immersed uh, to where it is a symbolic act of their death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're, uh, they're making their public statement to the community and to the world that they're now a part 
of the body of Christ. They're part of the community of Christ. And so uh, their baptism was a way of confessing that Jesus was in their heart. And so, again, the, the interesting thing is that, uh, again, looking back at the jailer, showing that th there was a, maybe a change in his heart, or we show that he immediately uh, had a, a heart for taking care of Paul and Silas, saying, man, you guys are, are really hurt. We need to take care of your wounds. Let's, let's, take, you, let's take you to our house, and uh, I'm going to wash up your wounds and bandage them. We're going to take care of you. And so... One scholar put it this way, unless our Christianity makes us kind, it is not real. So, uh, again, we don't know really what kind of temperament uh, the jailer had and uh, probably maybe one of the ones that actually had beaten Paul. And, uh, but the point was, Paul and Silas, but now he w had care, he had concern, he showed kindness towards them. So, uh, again, one of the things that we see when a person comes to Christ there is a character change. There's a basic, you know, the old nature is crucified and, and the, the Holy Spirit, our new spirit, uh, he uh, gives us the ability to, to show kindness in which was not originally there. Then we go on to verses 35 through 40. Uh, kind of the end of this, uh, end of the chapter story here. It says, now Paul and Silas leave Philippi. Verse 35, and it says, Now when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen, saying, Release those men. So we don't know whether uh, they had heard about the earthquake or they just said, Well, they've been there long enough. Uh, we need you to let them go. But anyway, release these men. So then the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, uh, come out now and go in peace. So uh, the jailer tells Paul, I guess they go back to jail, and says, man, it's okay, you can, you can just leave now. But look at 37, look, look, look what Paul says. He says, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without a trial, men who are Romans and have thrown us into prison, and now they're sending us away secretly? He said, no, indeed, this is not happening. But let them come themselves and bring us out. You're thinking, wait a minute, Paul, don't you just want to get out of there? Just, to, you know, take, take your stuff and, I mean, they're letting you out now, just get out and going. But Paul, no, again, shows his love in his heart because what was at stake here was more than just his hide. This is his and Silas's uh, comfort and just wanting to escape uh, further uh, persecution and prosecution. He goes, no, wait a minute. No, this was not right. What's happened. And those guys need to come themselves because we were Romans and what they did was wrong. You see, Paul was thinking about the believers in Philippi and their need for protection because Paul chose to exercise his Roman rights. Uh, Paul was concerned for the public reputation of the gospel message that he had been preaching. Uh, no doubt, uh, again, the church, because uh, these people were going to, uh, the Romans and the, the government officials were going to associate uh, Lydia and these other people who accepted Christ, the church in Philippi, with Paul. So if Paul had just kind of uh, kind of slinked out, just kind of uh, sloughed out on his own on the night, and so nobody knew, so... The community would have thought, man, this guy's just a charlatan. He's just a, a big liar. And, and so these people, they're just part of this false religion too. And so you see, uh, Paul had to, he, what he was doing. Uh, he was more concerned about the church than he was his own safety, saying, no, uh, we've got to make sure that the public knows that this, what we did was not wrong. So therefore, he insisted on the public vindication where uh, these officials would say, you know, guys, you're, you're, what you did was okay and we're sorry. Uh, because they, Paul wanted to make sure that they knew, the community knew that he was not a lawbreaker, that he was not uh, a troublemaker. Because if, again, if he had not cleared that up, it would have been trouble for those people in Philip. It's hard enough sharing the gospel uh, enough without being associated with someone who had caused us they thought had caused a scam and had turned things upside down and were, was making a mess and so Paul wanted to make it clear that a mistake was made you see there's sometimes you have to stand up and and make sure that people know said no what happened was wrong and this is why I did this 
And this has nothing to do with what was purport, was reported about that. So he was to make sure that they understood that Christianity was no threat to Rome. And again, that they had not done what was right by uh, jailing him and beating him without giving him a chance to talk. Look at verse 38. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates that they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Because now they're Paul and Silas, oh, the Romans, were up the creek. And they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. So they brought them out. And yet uh, identifying what was going on, but they still want them to leave the city. Um, so from there, verse 40 says, They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So Paul said, nope, pff, yeah, we're gone. But we're going to go check on our friends and make sure that they're okay. So again, once again, you see Paul's heart. He's concerned. Want to make sure that these people are okay before he leaves. Because they're all going, man, what happened to Paul? Man, if they put them in prison, are they going to put us in prison too? And so can you imagine the, the relief they had at Lydia's house? Can you imagine, uh, say, oh, Paul, you're okay. Silas, you're great. And, and thank you. You just cleared up all this mess. Thank you for doing it. I'm sure they, they were. And so once they had done that uh, and they encouraged them, uh, they, they encouraged these young Christians and, and then they departed. So uh, obvious, and, and when you read the, the, the letter to, uh, to the Philippians, uh, whenever you th read the Philippian the church, the letter of Philippians, I want you to think of Lydia, and I want you to think of the jailer, and I want you to think of their families and what they went through. And so it gives you some kind of a geographical context and gives you a, a kind of a cultural context, and actually the people, the, the, the community context of the people who were in that church. So even though they had suffered greatly and unjustly, we see that Paul saw great fruit of his labors, that, that God did not send him on a wild goose chase, that God had not uh, sent them to, to jail or to prison for, for, this, for sake of letting them get beat up and, and all that, but there was a purpose in the people in whom they would, would talk to. And then how people would come to Jesus. So again, uh, again, taking a step back here, we see the big picture. Uh, when we're involved in our life circumstance, we almost never understand or, can, or, or see or even think of the bigger picture. And so that's one of the things as far as the power of praise is that Paul saw the bigger picture, who is, which is God on his throne. All right, well, let's close with some lessons learned and then a, a question to ask. Uh, first lesson learned is very simply, people are watching. People are watching you. People are watching me. And the same way the jailer uh, and prisoners were watching Paul and Silas, are people watching you? You might say, well, I'm, I'm nothing special. I'm nothing important. I just kind of go about my day. But yeah, there's people in your neighborhood. There's people... Uh, in your apartment complex, people in your school, uh, wherever, the people are watching you. Uh, we need to specifically know that people are watching us when we go through hard times. They're, gonna, they're thinking, okay, what makes this person tick? What, uh, how much is it going to take before they, they curse God? Again, going back to, you know, think about Job and his friends. This, and his, Job's wife said to him, you know, just curse God and die. Yeah, well, of course, he, he didn't do that. But people are watching to see how much you can take. And so our reaction, this is very important, people are watching our reaction, uh, and our reaction to crisis, again, may make the difference as to whether they accept or reject Christ. Because when they see a Christian who just kind of a fair-weather Christian, and when things go bad, they just start mumbling and condemning God and judging God, They're, the people are watching and say, well, Obviously, God isn't any good to them when they're in this circumstance, so I don't think I need God. And so, especially when you're in crisis, that's where the rubber meets the road with your faith anyway. Remembering the big picture, but again, the big picture is, a part of that big picture is that people are watching you. How are you reacting to your crisis in, in your life? The next and very obvious lesson learned here, which is sort of the premise of our entire time together, is that praise opens doors. Praise opens doors because there is power in praising God. In the same way the prison doors were opened for Paul and Silas when they praised God, 
will God open doors for us when we praise him? Now, I'm not going to promise you if you go to prison for doing something wrong and you start praising God that you're going to get out. Now, if you're, if you're innocent, we're going to hope that you get out without any trouble. But when you praise God, most important, the, the most important closed door or room is what's around your heart. Uh, is, your door, is your heart enclosed in an inner prison of darkness and doubt and depression? But when you make a choice to praise God for the reality of that he is ultimately in control, he is on his throne, and Jesus is seated at his right hand interceding for you, and you've got the Holy Spirit, his spirit within you, when that is more real to you than the prison in which you sit or the hospital room in which you lay or in the circumstance in which you find yourself when God's throne and who is on his throne, that he is on his throne, is more important, more real than the pain that you're suffering, that's when the breakthrough is going to happen. That's when you're going to be able to praise him. And so you may still be in a prison cell. You still may be in a hospital room. You may still be in a rehab, uh, you know, fighting for uh, all the different physical abilities you're trying to get back. You may be, you know, try, you can't find a job. And, and, but the, what's even more true that the, the can help you with your attitude, even though you can't find the job and your, your health is going downhill, your relationships are breaking apart, your family's gone. What's even more important is you can praise God because he's still there with you and he is in control. That is why that's the power of praise. You can be freed from the dark inner prison that's, that your heart and your mind and your soul are in that can break you free. Again, if your eyes are focused on God, and, and it's a choice, and it's hard, and it's something we have to, again, C.S. Lewis has said, we have to act our way into a new way of feeling rather than feeling our way into a new way of acting. If you wait till you feel like praising God, you may never praise God. It has to be an act of, an act of your decision of choice of your will saying, I, God, I don't feel it. But I thank you and I praise you that you are in control of the situation. It doesn't look like anything, like that you're anywhere near it. I don't understand why you're allowing, allowing the pain in my life, both physical, emotional, and spiritual pain. I understand why you're letting these people do these things to me. Uh, and, and, but yet still, I'm going to praise you. And see, that's where the power is and that's where your faith grows. And that's when the prison doors can fling open in your heart. And then I would hope and pray that God would open physical doors of, of relationships, of, of jobs, of, of uh, education, whatever it is that you're looking for, that you're, you're chained in and, and you're in a, a, a prison cell. Uh, I pray that God will physically open those doors too. That, and see, the thing is that, uh, you know, it's, it's just so hard to get worked up and praising God. Go, ah, oh, son, when man, your feet are in the stocks. But we see here from this actual historical account of what happened, it, you know, his story is our story, uh, Paul's story, and it can be our story if we'll praise God. The other truth we see here is that God uses trials to bring others to Jesus. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, God uses trials to bring others to Jesus. You see, our praise of God in troubled times caused lost people to see their needs for Jesus and accept him as their Lord and Savior. See, Paul was definitely going through a trial. He's like, what have I done? I've done nothing, I've done nothing wrong and they wouldn't even listen to me. But it was definitely a trial. And through this trial, what happened? The jailer and his family became Christians. Not only that, was that their actions with the uh, possessed slave girl, they were vindicated. They were let free and they were able to set straight that Christianity, that believing in Christ uh, was not illegal, that there was no reason for that to happen. Last of all, let me uh, leave you with a question to ask. And this is again, going back to one of the pinnacles of, of this passage, such a great, great passage. And, uh, going back to the, the question that the jailer asked Paul, he asked, what must I do to be saved? 
Now, that is so important that we understand that, and and it's so important that we understand the question and we understand the answer that was given because, you see, this is what the Bible's about. It's about having a relationship with God. How do we get right with God? Because, again, of our sin nature, we... Uh, act of rebellion. We have gone our own way and told God to go his own way. So, you know, we're, we're headed, you know, uh, because of our choices and we've decided to go away from God. You know, we've, just, uh, uh, we've decided we want to spend eternity without him. Uh, a, a ter- uh, spend eternity a place without hope and condemnation and a place with condemnation. And so what must we do to be saved? Uh, is so important. The response is stunning. Now, again, when you think about all the things, how other people, other denominations would answer this question. Now, did Paul tell the jailer, well, you go clean up your life first. You quit uh, drinking and doing drugs and, and, uh, you know, gambling and all, you know, whatever it is else that people think, you know, he said, you do all this and then you, you clean your life up and then Jesus, you can come to Jesus. No, because you know, people, that's not what God says. Because Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. The lost uh, have no power to say no to those things. It's only when you come to Christ that God can help you with those issues that you're dealing with. And so here he said, he didn't tell, you know, go clean your life up. And then come back and talk to me in a week or two, maybe a month, and then, and then maybe no. He didn't. He didn't tell him to do that. So when you're talking, when someone says, "You, what do I have to do to be saved?" Don't say, "Well, go." Don't tell them, "Go clean your life up. Go to church. Uh, quit doing this and start doing that." No, that's not biblical. Uh, notice that he, they did not exhort him to forsake any particular sin. In other words, yeah, don't. He didn't say, "Well, oh, quit, quit lying to your wife." He didn't say, "Don't, don't uh, quit." slapping people on the head when they go by or beating people who are innocent. I uh, didn't tell them to, to quit, you know, to doing the things that uh, the lying or, or cheating or stealing. He didn't tell them to quit again. He said, well, you just better cut that out. And if you don't cut that out, you can't get saved. No. Again, the point is when you accept Christ and you have his spirit, he gives you the ability to stop doing those things. But again, don't tell tell somebody, well, you got to quit doing this before you can get right with God. Before you, you know, that if you do this, then God will save you. No. What do you do? You believe in Jesus. Believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sins, that you might be forgiven, that you will have eternal life. Notice them, they didn't tell, they, uh, Paul and Silas didn't tell them to go do anything. He said, yeah, you go, if you'll go out and be dunked, if you go out and be baptized, make sure you're in a certain river and, or maybe go out and sprinkle yourself with a little sprinkler and, and then you'll be saved. Or uh, he didn't say, hey, you go, you go get uh, circumcised, go cut yourself and, and, and come back and show me and, and then you'll be saved. Uh, he didn't tell the jailer, well, go write out, uh, write out or so many coins and, and give it to Lydia and you give so much money to the church and, and then you're going to be saved. No. What did he tell them to do? Believe in Jesus. Because you see all those other things as far as like, you know, he'll be, he was baptized as a result of salvation, not in order to get. So be careful when someone tells you the only way you're going to be saved, be saved is you've got to go out and do it. You've got to go out and pick up trash in the church parking lot or you've got to be in you got to be better be in church every time the doors open or you're not saved. You know, where is that coming from? What do you do to be saved? You ask Jesus. You believe in the name of Jesus. You, you believe in Christ. Now, as a result of that, you want to be around other believers. You want to be uh, with, with other believers uh, in worship and in Bible study. Um, but what do they say? Right? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. You see, trusting faith in Christ, apart from anything else we bring to the table, uh, is, is what it's all about. Trust in Christ, nothing else. And because, you know, because of our uh, disobedience, because of our sin, we deserve to be separated from God for all eternity in a devil's hell. We, we deserve that because we want nothing to do with God. But even though what we deserve, God gives us his grace. For by grace through faith are you, are you saved when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is another major underpinning truth of, of this passage. The power of praise, but also before you can really praise God, before you can praise God at all, you've got to start by having 
a relationship, a salvation experience with God the Father through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is what enables you to be able to praise God through the Holy Spirit in your life in spite of the circumstances. So the most important thing is to make sure today is that have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you trusted Christ to pay for your penalty of your sins? Have you allowed him, his spirit, to come into your life? And if you will do that, uh, just in the same way, you know, Lydia's life was changed and the jailer's life was changed, uh, God will change your life. Uh, how fast and how soon and how many areas? Again, that's up to you and God. But the point is he can and will help you give you the power of praise to face the inner darkness in which today you feel like you are, you're in prison, you're in the bonds of, of chains and stock, uh, in the stocks, your feet and hands are in stocks and, and you're, just, you know, you're just chained in. If you'll accept Christ and as you've accepted Christ, praise that God is bigger than the picture, that God's working outside of what you're seeing, uh, you're gonna see all, all sorts of miracles happen. Let's pray. God, I pray for uh, all those who are listening today who feel like uh, they're in prison. Maybe those who are in, literally in prison today who are listening to uh, this pas about this passage of Scripture. Lord, we know the truth very simply that, that the power of praise, that it can change our heart attitudes, it can char change our mental condition. Uh, just the way we look at reality, that our, our, our relationship with you and how it frees us up is more true than any report that a doctor can give us or, or anything else is going on in our lives. But if we can have that peace that surpasses on understanding by having that relationship and, and, and by you guarding our hearts in Christ Jesus, that we can make a difference as far as in our own lives and be, being uh, praising you rather than condemning and cursing you for the things that happen in our life. So Father, the other thing we just pray, uh, I pray is this for anyone here that does not know you and they're not sure what to do but Lord this passage makes it very simple uh, to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to believe in Jesus and Lord right now I, I pray that many would just open their hearts and believe that they could have that assurance of salvation the assurance that their sins are forgiven the assurance that when they die they're going to heaven the assurance of all the shame and guilt and sin will be dealt with and they can have their slate clean that their dirty laundry can be washed and they can be uh, white as snow so lord thank you for this incredible passage and lord may that uh, may the truths that we've seen here may they uh, infiltrate our lives and and just uh, capture our hearts so we might be free through the power of praise we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.